Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that your will be done when we are gathered together. We pray that you send your Holy Spirit to guide us in understanding the Holy Scriptures, written by the Holy Spirit, submitted by the Holy Spirit, and revealed by the Holy Spirit to each and every one of us. We search the scriptures for wisdom, for instruction, and to understand thy will and thy character, to make illuminate our lives and to please our creator, to glorify our creator in this earthly existence and be representatives of the heavenly kingdom. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray this prayer. Amen. Good afternoon, everybody who is here today for this live recording. And I have chosen the topic of biblical entrepreneurship by the case study of King Solomon as God's chief entrepreneur, because he has been the most outstanding, um, prosperous king and individual in the entire human history. According to the Hebrew Bible, the Israelite monarchy gained its highest splendor and wealth during the Solomon's reign of 40 years. In a single year, according to 1 Kings 10.14, Solomon collected tribute amounting to 666 talents. That is converted into modern measures is nearly 40,000 pounds of gold. That surpasses anybody we even know today living on earth. Solomon is described as surrounding himself with all the luxuries and the grandeur of the Eastern monarch. And his government prospered. He entered into the alliance with Hiram the first, king of Tyre, who in many ways greatly assisted him in his numerous undertakings. If rich men were not destined to enter the kingdom of heaven, then what would happen to God's favored one, King Solomon? It is not that riches that stop you from entering the heavenly kingdom. But that would be a new um, presentation topic about the heavenly treasures and the questions asked about entering heaven. But King Solomon, his example, I would like to um, look at it why is he so much favored by the gods? He was born as an illegitimate, illegitimate son of King David and Bathsheba. He didn't start out in a glorified origin. He was born into sin, not because of the original sin of humans. And that is again another discussion because I don't believe original sin is what we think it is. But King Solomon was born into sin that he, Bathsheba's husband has been removed from the way. He has been subject to David's plot. But King Solomon, who was originally named Prince Jedediah, was one of the favorite ones of King, uh, King David, because he was born out of love and lust of Bathsheba. Solomon has been given the opportunity to be raised as a prince with all the wisdoms of his time gathered in, in the, the book of Proverbs. And this book Today is very well documented, word by word, just as it has been in the ancient scriptures. 
Solomon has written them down, but this was by word of mouth, passed down to him and drilled into him as a child. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. For gaining wisdom and instruction for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning and let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings of the riddles and wisdom. This book of Proverbs were written in order to document the enormous wisdom that King Solomon has possessed. When he was um, crowned and God had in a prayer asked him, what is the foremost and most precious thing that he would want God to give him? The answer was wisdom, the most precious possession, wisdom. And we here need to know that King David would have loved to build a temple for God in first Kings. Second Kings, by the way, sorry, first, first Kings. But God had turned him down via his prophet, Nathan. He told K uh, King David that um, his hands are too full of war and blood and murder. Therefore, he's not fit to raise the temple for the Lord. But his son, King Solomon, um, his seed is going to build a temple for God. And that was basically the almost the number one and foremost uh, project of King Solomon as soon as he became a king. And we will, we will tell that story shortly. But before I start, I would also have liked to mention that King Solomon not only was praised and um, honored for his wisdom that was obviously by the people who lived around him named a divine wisdom, an undescribable um, amount of capacity for discernment and um, discernment of good and evil. But he was also worshiped by his lovers and, he, and his court for his exceptional fairness and beauty as a man. And we can admire that um, adoration by, uh, by via the, the Songs of Solomon, that is um, a book in the Bible shortly before Proverbs. And today I would most certainly like to give more heed to the um, aspects of King Solomon's life that are concerning economy, prosperity, and wealth. Um, for some years before his death, David was engaged in collecting materials for building a temple in Jerusalem as a permanent home for Yahweh and the Ark of the Covenant. Solomon is described as completing its construction and the help of an architect also named Hiram, a neighboring king. And other materials sent from King Hiram of Tyre. Now, why it is so incredibly significant is because King Hiram and the neighboring kings at the time of King David, were all in conflict and mostly in war, and they feared King David. They were even more fearing his son, the inheriting the throne, King Solomon, because of his incredible and legendary wit and wisdom. 
But King Solomon, as soon as have taken the throne, decided to make peace with all the surrounding countries. And that was his greatest and most entrepreneurially harmonious and wisest step ever among all the kings. By creating peace, he allowed the countries and the surrounding countries as well to recover from the co constant conflict and warring. He made friends and connections, and he was able to make uh, business connections based on those relationships that were mutually beneficial. And in time of peace, his own country was not only able to recover, but to accumulate wealth way beyond the imaginations of the past centuries. After the completion of the temple, Solomon is described as erecting many other buildings of importance in Jerusalem. For 13 years, he was engaged in the building of a royal palace called Othel. Now, I just wanted to mention that part, but I will be focusing on the building of the temple that is very much detailed out in the book of Samuel, the second book of Samuel and the second book of Kings. Besides the fact that Solomon has um, created peace and agreement within his country and with the surrounding countries, he also um, allowed other um, surrounding countries to travel through the territories of Israel with very minimal taxes to be paid, very minimal wages. This has encouraged merchants and travelers to choose Israel to go across the country leaving their merchandise and good deals within the country. Also, the craftsmen in his country has enjoyed this special accomplishment um, just by the project of uh, building the temple, all finer forms of crafts of woodwork, uh, weavery and textiles, um, metal and, and, and precious metal workers, um, builders and um, um, engineers and architects, did any of them with those practical skills were highly appreciated, acknowledged, and even sung about. The um, What we know is that the cooks and servants who have been working these um, craftspeople have uh, been also very well paid, appreciated for their work. Therefore, communities flourished and um, prospered around the project of the temple building. It is in itself was building up a nation, not just a temple. Originally, we should think, what did God have in mind by appointing Solomon to build the temple? Did God really need a temple to dwell in? The instructions to return to the original sanctuary instructions and make it more permanent had been directly given by um, by. Um, God himself to the prophet Nathan who communicated it to, to the workers and Solomon. But God must have had in mind also to build up the entire nation that lived around the first temple. It was a tremendous amount of prosperity um, in that age for the Israelites. But 
King Solomon has also made contracts with the surrounding countries that were using um, business and entrepreneurial methods and tools that were not very well known in his time, very rarely used. And one of them is um, in Second Kings, right from the beginning, when King Solomon is uh, making um, a contract with, a verbal contract with Hiram the first, is to send wood from his country, from the upper parts of the mountains, and ship them down, in, um, um, how do you call it? It is that in the river, to have them swim down the river, send them down the river to Israel, it's easier to transport it that way. But his his country did not have the necessarily wood skill, woodworking skills. So he said, why don't you send your men too and we will feed them and house them and pay them. And in return, we're going to give you more merchandise. He traded in exchange of skilled workers. And it is it is a good part to to read in the Bible, this trading in itself. But why was Solomon chosen to be the the most prosperous king? Why did he turn out to be? First of all, because he knew that wisdom was the most precious possession, telling discerning good from evil, and he asked, and God had blessed him immensely for that. Secondly, is because he was constantly in praise and worship of the Lord. Um, I um, would like to read one of the, the Solomon's prayers from the book of Kings is legendary for this reason. And um, well, um, yes, I may even be able to read that, find it for you here in a big improvised um, moment. Okay. First Kings were in chapter eight. That's right. You can look it up over there. And I'm just going to read the last verse that belongs there. And it was so that when Solomon had made an end of praying all his prayer and supplication unto the Lord, he rose from before the altar of the Lord from kneeling on his knee with his hands spread up to heaven. And he stood and blessed all the congregation of Israel with a loud voice saying, Blessed be the Lord that has given rest unto his people Israel. According to all that he promised, he hath not failed one word or his good promise, which he promised by the hand of Moses his servant, the Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. Let him not leave us nor forsake us. Why do I read this? Why is it so important? That prayer is actually an incredible um, worship service in itself. And once you get the chance, please uh, read First Kings chapter 8 to to um, contemplate it for yourself. But here I would have liked to um, draw attention to the word promise and promises. Let the Lord not fail his promises. Any, we have mentioned it yesterday already, but I'm happy to repeat that all promises of the Lord in the Bible stated 
comes with one condition. And these promises, we could study, there is more than a thousand of them throughout the Bible, and every single one of them has a correlating um, condition. The reason why Solomon was so vastly, vastly blessed is because he heeded the request of the Lord. He didn't just pray, 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 but he paid attention to what God has put out as conditions of wisdom to, to re be able to receive the blessing. And that is the very result of Proverbs, where most um, discernment of good from evil is being um, listed. It's originally been written for princes, but it, it, today I should really encourage anybody and everybody to keep up with the within the education for that reason. And we will get back to education in a moment. The Bible says, God gives you power to get wealth. It is written in Deuteronomy 8.18. Have you ever noticed that great promise and claimed it for your life? This verse doesn't just say he will give you money. As wonderful as that may be. The promise is much greater than that. If you follow his instructions, the Lord will give you the ability to create wealth. The ability to create wealth. Jesus said he came to his followers, may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. John 10.10. 10. In the Amplified Translation, he says he wants us to have and enjoy life. Jesus didn't come just so we could make a living. He wants us to experience an abundant life. Perhaps you are thinking at this point that um, you don't need more prosperity. But how selfish is that when you look around and see how many good causes and and um, projects are going on worldwide that are supporting, for example, children who are struggling in orphanages with AIDS, or they need pencils in schools. Um, all kinds of diseases and crimes are happening around the world and money is being raised by donations for every single one of them. And how many ministries in the media are feeding those millions in whose nations it is illegal to preach the gospel by conventional means. I like that David uh, Cerullo says, he says, God is looking for people who love to bless others. I couldn't agree more. In fact, in the Abrahamic blessings yesterday and even the day before, we put special emphasis on that the spiritual Israelites are blessed with three blessings to receive and one mission. And in order to qualify as a spiritual Israelite or a spiritual seed of Abraham, you need to fulfill that call for mission as well. In order for the Jewish nation, their mission was is to be a blessing onto other nations. And they failed. It took a Jesus to come to earth to fulfill that mission in one person, single-handedly. But the mission, it was even though it was fulfilled, it's not complete. Jesus has left and he passed on the same commission to his disciples. And because of his disciples, it was for all of his disciples. The Abrahamic blessings do not come without a condition. And that condition is to serve the kingdom of God in the form of the Great Commission. That has been renewed by Jesus. 
You see, God is looking for people to say, Lord, I want to receive your abundance so that I could bless others abundantly, give you back to you and give back to your kingdom. And I want to receive this abundance so I could bless your people. As a child of God, you should expect his favor. That favor can cause you to regain in a day what the enemy has stolen from you, you in years. You should prepare for times of lack and times of plenty and times of lack again. But that is more like the strategies of wealth and how you should be using and applying your wealth. But Abraham was also blessed, not only with wealth, but influence. And that's what King Solomon has so much taken to its absolute and ultimate peak of it in the book of Proverbs, where he recorded the education that he was raised on, documented the wisdoms that have forged him and blacksmithed him as a person, a character, a leader, a prince, and an influencer, an influencer in the word that influencing his country, his people, and all of the generations coming after him who read the Proverbs and taken it up as a book of wisdoms for educating the young generations. Why is it so very, very important Wisdom and success are only a couple clicks away. In Proverbs 30, 17, we, we learn about how incredibly important it is for the parents to pay attention to their children and to um, educate them in discernment and wisdom. In Proverbs 6, 6, it is the instruction is given to the teachers who diligently um, educate the children and students, princes and new um, members of society. In Proverbs eleven twenty two, it speaks to the women who don't know how to act or how to um, reserve righteousness within their households. In Proverbs, it is addressed to, um, Proverbs 5, 19, it is addressed to the wife and their wisdom and, and, and choices of cherishing their husbands and their own body and sexuality in marriage. In Proverbs 16, 4, we, we hear about um, um, seven words that answer the hardest questions and so on and so on. Um, education of the nation in all generations and all walks of life is a huge concern for Solomon. He is probably the first king in history who has invested enough, so much in education that he actually wrote the school book, which is Proverbs for generations to come. King Solomon's economy it can be unlocked in six wisdom truths. And I will shortly touch up on the six wisdom truths that you can already today begin to apply in your own life and your own household. And I wanted you to, to leave with these six instructions um, that would already prepare you as a biblical entrepreneur, whether if as a head of a household, leader of a company, or as um, starting out self um, self-made entrepreneur when you are gathering your own um, gifts and skills from scratch. And here is the six of them. 
Number one, he who tills his land will have plenty of food, but he who follows empty pursuits will have poverty in plenty. Proverbs 28, 19. The message here is if you plan to eat, you better work. Second, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, then your poverty will come as a robber and your want like an armed man. Proverbs 24, 33 to 34. You will never succeed by sleeping. So get up and be industrious. What's the first point and the second one in a different way addressing the then if you want prosperity, you have to be industrious. Number three, there is treasure to be desired and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man splendeth it up. Proverbs 21, 20. Don't squander your savings. And what are those treasures that you are desiring? That's going to be our next presentation tomorrow. Gathering treasures in heaven. Number four. Wealth obtained by fraud dwindles, but the one who gathers by labor increases it. Proverbs 13, 11. Make honesty of your financial foundation. That's the solid rock, ladies and gentlemen. That's the solid rock of building your house on the rock. Make honesty of your financial foundation. Number five, know well the condition of your flocks and pay attention to your herds for riches are not forever nor does a crown endure all generations. Proverbs 27, 24 to 20, 23 to 24. Wealth is only temporary. And we will study that even deeper when we're going to talk about the, the t gathering um, and saving, accumulating wealth. And especially when it comes to preparing for e preparing in the time of plenty for the time of lack and what the cycles are. Um, wealth is only temporary. Number six, give God what belongs to him. And I could have made this the number one. Why? Because Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Proverbs 3, 9 to 10. This is what we call tithing. And it's supposed to be always the very first produce of um, within our businesses. And you are welcome to make your own assessment and how many much of this you do actually practice. But um, in order for us today to have um, a case study of King Solomon, I would like to largely emphasize that King Solomon had a, a great sense of priorities. He knew the most valuable things on earth. He knew the most valuable things in heaven. He knew the concept of service to others. He knew the value of peace and living in peace with our neighborhoods. And he knew how to invite and bring people onto the faith the true faith of God. And how he ended up splendoring it all is not today's um, presentation's topic, 
if you would like to have more com more insight into the life of um, Solomon and even discuss that further, then I suggest that you tune in on Sunday here into the same blog where we're going to turn to King Solomon as a person in greater detail. So that is for the ecumenical overview. King Solomon as God's chief entrepreneur. And we would like to close in prayer um, to bless all those who have gathered here today and all those who will watch this recording in the future that they may be blessed by the information with the propagation of the kingdom economics so that they would be more and more attracted to you, dear Lord, and that they would become more and more attractive to you, dear Lord, for your will and your purposes to become a vessel in their lives for your works to glorify you, dear Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Bye-bye.